on to the Sphere Society um, webinar. Um, it's going to be exciting. It's certainly exciting for us in Yorkshire to hear about something that is truly of outstanding world scale, in my view, um, in the world of Mesolithic development and some of the work that the British Sphere Society has done with it. I'd like to welcome this evening some um, guests from the Council for Protection of Rural England and from Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust and from BASC, as well as our um, uh, BDS um, people. And as we were talking in the preamble beforehand, we've got um, some people this evening who are key to this um, little talk who are also juggling children and just to have knobs on it are also juggling dogs and puppies as well. So it's it's quite a dynamic and fluid um, and friendly um, webinar this, this evening. Um, and my special thanks, I like to say it first in case I forget it, goes to Laura, who is working behind the scenes to make sure absolutely everything works. Um, and she does a wonderful job. And unlike the foreign office today, it's not crashing. So we're, we're wonderful. I know that's um, kind of pushing my luck just a little bit. But it, it really is a warm welcome to this um, really, really interesting and unusual um, topic. Where I'm delighted that we've got Ben Elliott, um, who gave some talks for the British Deer Society at the annual general meeting uh, a number of years ago, and then gave us an update in Deer Journal, and Dr. Amy Little, um, who's from York University, Ben from Newcastle. And we have a researcher who, forgive me, I have lost his name again. If Ben could supply that with me. It's, it's Andy Langley. He's not here yet, but um, I'll, be, I'll be talking about his research and I'll introduce him to the course of the presentation. Okay. And Andy Langley, um, as and when he gets here. <clears throat> so um, it, it's interesting because kind of the centre of the world is um, uh, Yorkshire at the moment, because although it's a completely different period and it's not quite a million years BC and all that sort of thing, we did have a gigronchus um, dinosaur footprint found on the Yorkshire coast um, today. But in actual fact, we come much, 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 much more forward um, into the Mesolithic period when we're talking about Star Car. And there might be quite a number of people who do not know a lot about Star Car, um, Ben and Amy. And um, I mean, in, in the, the great scale of things, is Star Car of outstanding world heritage? Um, yes, yes, it is. Uh, it's a really important site in terms of, um, you know, you, you think of the big kind of periods of prehistory um, and for the Mesolithic period, this 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 chunk of time um, in the Holocene since the end of the last ice age when hunter gatherers were the, the, the kind of dominant lifeway um, right across Europe, Star Car is probably the most high profile site that we have um, from the continent. So it is a it's of an international significance. It's a site that has a really rich research history, um, you know, going back to the sort of 1940s and 50s. And it's a site that's been revisited numerous occasions with cutting edge methods. And it's a site that really kind of sets the, sets the pace for research into the, the Mesolithic period. Um, yeah, it was uh, it, working at Starcar, especially uh, excavating at Starcar between 2013 and 2015. Um, we really did feel that the eyes of the Mesolithic community from across Europe were were, were on us, and we hosted numerous kind of site visits. We had a, we had a, we had a day where we had uh, researchers from all across Europe, um, and, you know, and people travelled people travelled from all across Europe to go and visit Starcar when when the excavations were open. I mean, they're, they're archaeologists, so it wasn't um, <laughs> they had an in, a vested interest in 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 the period and, and in the archaeology of the period and, and what we were doing at the site. Um, but it is it's a real it's, it's a really internationally significant site, and it's a site that people all around the world who studied archaeology at university um, will have will have heard of. As a adage that everybody who's in an archaeology degree would have had to have written an essay about Star Car at some point, and I'm never sure whether that's co quite as complimentary as people <laughs> seem to think it is. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a very well I, well known I, site. I think that is a is, is a great compliment, and I mean at heart I'm part historian and part geographer and I always look at why is it there do we have any clue as to why it's there why did they choose that particular spot um well it's a that's a really good question Morris um it fits with a number of patterns and again working with our kind of um European colleagues has really helped us to start to pick out some of these questions at the start of the Holocene um we see this 
prevalence for wetland and lake edge occupation by groups of hunter gatherers across Europe. So hunter gatherers, you know, these kind of really rich ecotones where you've got open water, reed swamp, forest fringing, with lots of different kinds of environment coming together in a small space. Um, is a real kind of magnet for for, for hunter gatherer settlement and hunter hunter gatherer activity because there's lots of different resources that can be exploited in those kinds of environments. Um, interestingly, though, it's more than just it's, it's more than just wanting to be by the edge of a lake. There are other sites um, situated around the edges of Lake Blixton that, that Stark are originally sat sat alongside. Um, and there's another pattern that comes through from the European ar archaeological picture, which is uh, situations on promontories. So we know that when Starkar was occupied, it sat on this kind of finger of, of, of dry land, which extended out into the lake by several hundred metres, um, close to the lake's outflow. So it's where Lake Blixton was draining out towards um, the Derwent. And it's um, that, that, again, is, is a repeated pattern that we see at the start of the Holocene in terms of where people are situating these large settlement sites. They tend to be on peninsulas um, that have access to open water, but also have um, good lines of sight across in, in flows and outlets as well. So we think that might be to do some, have something to do perhaps with the way in which uh, waterways and networks of, of rivers and streams and, and lakes are important kind of conduits for, for communication and also transport and movement. So it's about keeping an eye on, on what's coming in and what's going out of the lake, as well as exporting the resources that are around and, and close to hand. And we, we generally think about these people as staying quite close to bank, quite close to their base. Were they actually traveling very far and were the connections across the continent? Yeah, yeah. So there's quite a lot of evidence for um, for, for movement at Starkar. Um, and I think the thing we have to remember is that uh, when occupied, Starkar was actually on the edges of, of what, what, we, what we think of as Doggerland or North Sea Land. So at the start of the Holocene, sea levels are much lower and we have this really large expanse this land bridge that stretches right across the east coast of britain over to the low countries in the netherlands and belgium um, and we have evidence for the movement of materials and people we've got some uh, baltic amber which which is turning up at star car um, but also a general sort of cultural um homogeneity um between the people living on the other side of the north sea that we can observe um, in the early Holocene and, and people occupying Star, uh, the sites of Starkar. There are hints in the archaeology of Starkar that this might be a site that um, lots of people are coming to visit at particular times and, and to mark particular occasions. So we have evidence of really kind of big consumption events, sort of feasting, if you like, you know, the, the consumption of multiple large cervids, large ungulates in, in a single event, which doesn't really fit with the kind of the pattern of what we think groups, of, the size of groups of people might be. Um, at this particular point in in North Yorkshire, so it seems to be a a, a, a spot where people are travelling, um, perhaps beyond their kind of normal their normal patterns of mobility uh, to visit at certain times um, and engage in certain activities. So yeah, there's 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 evidence all around the lake, and the lake's kind of four kilometres long. That there's lots of people doing stuff. That there's people doing stuff around that lake and using Star Car as a hub. But there's also evidence that people are travelling from further afield um, and visiting the site from from further afield. OK, well, I hope those sort of introductory questions have sort of paved the way and got everybody's brain cells going. Um, we know that this is a site that's just south of Scarborough. Mm -hmm. um, it's accessible for the public. Um, and perhaps now, rather than me talk and ask any questions, um, we'll let you give us an update on how things are progressing. OK, all right. Is that, is that fine with you? Go. That is absolutely fine. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Shall I, shall I share my screen? Shall I do a bit of yes, that? please. I start my slideshow. Here we go. Okay, um, so thanks very much for that introduction, Morris. Um, the news from Starcar really uh, is that the British Deer Society is brilliant. <laughs> and I, I wanted to. Um, I think this, this, this talk tonight is going to be a bit of a loving, actually, um, appreciation for the, the contributions that the British Deer Society has made towards uh, research at Star Car, um, but also uh, to research further afield, which is really helping us to understand um, the Mesolithic in Britain, what's happening during this period in Britain, but also further afield and the relationship between Britain and Europe at the very start of the Mesolithic 
and also towards the end of the Mesolithic. So I um, invited to give this talk and I really thought it'd be a great opportunity to say a massive thank you to all the, the, the support that the BDS has given um, my research and, and Amy's research over the years um, to maybe sort of highlight some of the donations of dear materials that people have made to us um, over the years, just kind of spotlight where those materials have gone, what we've done with them and what we've learned from the work that we've been, been doing with those with those pieces of pieces of deer, responding to some fairly um, obscure requests from us in terms of um, demands for, for certain things at certain times. Um, and through that, show you where research has been moving at Starcar, but also show you more broadly how this relationship between myself and Amy and the BDS uh, is really benefiting and enriching our understanding of, of this particular period of the archaeological past and this particular chunk of our heritage. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to. It's been a rotten year for some, for, for a lot of us, and uh, I wanted to to really give this a, a positive, a positive spin and show my appreciation for all the support um, that we've received from the BDS and, and highlight what your what our what this relationship is is doing for our understanding of, of this entire period. Um, star car and beyond um one of the things i think i should do before we start is to make some introductions because um i often talk in in partnership with with dr amy little um and uh we've worked together we've collaborated on lots of different things uh but we've been working with the bds or i've been first in contact with the bds in in 2011 i think um so for you know the best part of a decade now and uh, throughout that time, we've moved around a bit and um, the, the nature of our collaboration, collaboration and our professional relationships changed quite considerably. Uh, we have the annoying habit of working for the same institutions, but at different times. So occasionally, I'm, you might have heard me speak as Ben Elliott of the University of York. Occasionally, you might have heard um, Amy speaking uh, as, as, as from, from different institutions that she's been involved in. Um, but I just wanted to, to give you a brief timeline of, of, of where we've been the institutions that, that have benefited from uh, the, the research that, that, that we've been able to undertake with the support of the British Deer Society. So I uh, do my undergraduate degree and, and my PhD at the University of York uh, before moving down to London in 2015 um, where I was working on a project that was in partnership with the British Library and then uh, took up a fellowship at, at UCD in, in Dublin from 2017 to 2019 and I'm now currently um, at the University of Newcastle Whilst um, in UCD at Dublin, uh, I was working with, very lucky to work with the uh, Centre for, Experiment, um, for Experimental Archaeology and Material Culture, um, which, is a, which is an experimental archaeology centre. Um, and whilst there, I was carrying out experiments using materials donated by the British Deer Society, um, but uh, at the, at the centre in, in Dublin. And I'll show you some images from those experiments later on. Uh, Amy Little, who's the co-author of this paper, um, she was at UCD uh, for her PhD. Uh, before moving on to, to complete a fellowship at, at Leiden University, where she was working with experimental methods, um, and then moving to the University of York, where she set up her own experimental centre, the Year, Exper Year Centre, so that's the York Experimental Archaeological Research Centre, um, where a lot of the experiments that have been carried out that I'll show you images from uh, today are, are based. So there's, um, yes, we, we have stayed the same people as we've been working with the BDS, but we've moved around and our affiliations have changed. Um, uh, so if anyone's kind of wondering where they are in the world or, or where the photographs they're looking at were taken, um, but hopefully that'll give you a little bit of context. A quick recap then um, for what the Mesolithic period is, because one of the kind of striking features of the Mesolithic is that nobody really seems to know uh, what it is or what, what it's about. Uh, the Mesolithic, <clears throat> I've mentioned the word Holocene, a few times already today. Um, the Mesolithic is this period of time from the start of the Holocene through to the arrival of agriculture in Europe generally, where we see hunter-gatherer groups uh, living in temperate forested environments. So uh, what I've got here, um, can you see my cursor? Is that possible to see my cursor with a thumbs up? Yeah, you can, Brian. Um, so what we've got here is a, is a end grip. So this is a, this is a Greenland ice core uh, and these kind of peaks you can see here correspond to global annual temperatures. Um, so we're moving through time this way, and you can see we've got these low global temperatures here, which is the ice age, the Pleistocene. And then we've got this really sharp rise here, which is the start of the Holocene, which starts around about 9,600 Cal BC. Um, and then we can see this kind of gradual, well, it's, a, it's kind of overall trend shows this kind of gradual rise in temperature coming up to climates and kind of Temperatures, annual temperatures are around maybe sort of two or three degrees warmer than we have today in the UK. 
Um, and that kind of marks the what we call the, the Holocene um, climatic optimum. It's this kind of warm, wet period in Britain in particular, but right across Europe um, that characterises hunter-gatherer groups living, living for this period of time. Um, in Britain, the arrival of agriculture comes in at around between sort of 4,100 uh, BC to 3,800 BC, and it's a similar time for Ireland as well. Um, so we have this kind of really long, several millennia, several thousand years, thousands of years after the Ice Age, after the, the melting of the glaciers, where Britain is um, Britain is populated by hunter-gatherers living in these really uh, rich, temperate environments. And they are rich, you know, they're really ecologically productive environments that, that we see right across Europe at this time. So um, we have this sort of succession of different colonizing uh, tree species, flora, at the start of the Holocene. So as the kind of Early, very earliest stages of the Mesolithic, we've got kind of sparse birch forests, kind of pine forests, which are sort of rapidly replaced by um, deciduous woodlands, and we get the establishment of these really kind of um, extensive, open deciduous woodland. And it's the kinds of ecologies that we tend to think of as being the sort of indigenous ecologies that we have uh, in Britain today. It's kind of it's a tricky term, and there's all sorts of issues in terms of rewilding agendas and policies as to what is an original. British ecology. I'm sure that there'll be areas of areas of debate and, and research that you might be familiar with in terms of thinking about woodland management and, and, and what we want to get our get our ecologies to in terms of in terms of management and, and, and sustainability. Um, but yeah, these these kind of rich, rich, rich deciduous woodlands. Well, amongst that, we've got uh, bits of variation. So we've got kind of areas of, of heath and, and grassland particularly in the upland areas. And that's something that actually gets established in the Mesolithic. So um, it's the burning of, of woodland in upland areas during the Mesolithic that starts off that cycle of peat formation and creates some of those um, some of those more open landscapes that we see today. Um, but that's not a constant throughout the Mesolithic. At, at earlier periods in time, um, some of those higher altitudes are, are, are wooded. Um, and we get the establishment of tree lines. So you've got species like, you know, uh, pine and pine, Appearing at higher altitudes and in, and in colder climatic conditions across the across Ireland and the British Isles. Um, in terms of animals, uh, again, we've got this kind of pioneering stage of, 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 of species moving into Britain uh, at a time where Britain is joined to mainland Europe through the Doggerland um, land bridge. So uh, we've got red deer, aurochs, sort of wild cow, um, elk. So alces, alces um, in Britain in the in the early Mesolithic certainly. Um, roe deer, wild boar, beaver, badger, pine marten hare, um, lots of the species that we think of being um, um, na na natural in, 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 Brit in Britain today. Um, wild cat, a few, yeah, a few, a few species that have become extinct since the Mesolithic, but the kind of core, the core kind of faunal ecology that, that we think of when we think of um, rural Britain today. I think sometimes if I'm talking about the Upper Paleolithic, I have to really kind of ask people to imagine a time when you know mammoths rolled roamed the, the tundra and the steppe in derbyshire um and that's a kind of a stretch of the imagination people have to kind of work a bit a bit to kind of imagine those landscapes but if i'm talking about the the, the mesolithic it's a time when badgers roamed the <laughs> roamed the midlands of britain so it's not not such a leap such a leap perhaps um and this last image uh, down at the bottom right here uh, this is kind of a, a plot of the coastland lines at the start of the Mesolithic period. So at the start of the Holocene, um, as the ice cores are beginning to melt slowly, um, we have this really kind of extensive lowland land bridge which connects um, Britain to, to northwestern Europe. Um, and what happens is as we progress through the Mesolithic, that gradually becomes inundated. Um, and it doesn't happen, it's not a process which happens in a kind of linear fashion. It's kind of quite sort of stop-start. And we get kind of archipelagos forming and periods of time where um, land is lost very, very quickly and periods of time where it seems to stabilise and stay stable for a while. So although we have this kind of slow increase in sea levels, that doesn't necessarily translate into a kind of incremental eating away from the edges of that of that land mass you can see in the picture there. Um, but by about, by about 5,000 Cal BC, um, the coastlines that we know for Britain and Northern Europe uh, today have formed. And we do have this kind of the, the North Sea as we know it is, is, is there. So that's a process that plays out throughout the Mesolithic. And during the early Mesolithic, um, Britain is very much connected to, to, to Europe through this land bridge. Um, but that's, a, that's something that kind of changes as the period progresses. 
So um, in terms of the research that we've undertaken to date at Starcar um, in collaboration with the BDS, uh, the first project I wanted to talk about was a project of my own, um, which was kind of run as, as part of my undergraduate degree, my undergraduate dissertation. Um, and it was a project working with a chap called Charles Critchley, uh, who's a member of the BDS, and he donated um, some shared red deer antler uh, to allow me to do a carry out a series of experiments to investigate the production of a type of artifact we find at Starcar called barbed points. Okay, so these are um, pieces of antler ranging in length from between sort of 30 centimeters to 12 centimeters, uh, and they're projectile tips. So they're kind of we think they're being used as the tips for spears or arrows, perhaps, um, and they're wickedly sharp. And they often have a series, well, they all have a series of, of kind of sweeping barbs along one, well, out, along one edge. So they're hunting tools. We think they're hunting tools. Um, and we find hundreds of them at Starcar. So um, there's, a, there's a real quantity of these objects um, that have been recovered from the site. One of the other things we find at Starcar is um, a considerable amount of red deer antlers that have been worked uh, through a very specific technique. So it's called the groove and splinter technique. And it involves using flint tools to incise kind of parallel grooves along the length of the beam of the red deer antler and to create this kind of define a sort of rectangle of, of compactor material that's then prized out. And the way they prize it out is by um, taking the tines off, <clears throat> so bashing the tines off, using the tines as wedges and prizing the, the intervening piece of, 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 of antler out. That's then worked down again using flint tools into these kind of um, sharp. Uh, hunting tools. Um, so that's a process that's been that's been documented since the 1950s, since the site was originally excavated. Uh, but in the 1970s, there was um, all sorts of questions being raised about this, about whether um, the role that Starcar played within the wider landscape, whether the entire bar point manufacturing process was being carried out at Starcar, or whether that people were bringing antlers to the site, removing these strips of antler, these splinters, taking them elsewhere in the landscape, finishing them off into barb points, and then returning them to Starcar itself. So there was this kind of debate about the role that this site was playing within a wider landscape settlement system. And it all hinged around where is the evidence for barb point production. And the authors working at the time sort of speculated that, oh, you know, if you're, if you're cutting these kind of rectangular strips into, into barbs, um, you would have the negative of the mate of creating those barbs left as as traces, and we'd see that in the archaeological record. So they were talking about maybe sort of little. Why don't we see any little triangles of antler or little lozenges that would be made when you were carrying this out? Um, and there was kind of it's an open question when I was doing my, my undergraduate dissertation, and so I decided I wanted to investigate it. So we looked at the material from Starcar in terms of the finds and and, and thought about how. This process was going to be playing out and we, we took some red deer antler and we soaked it, soaked it up for a bit and then very clumsily and kind of <clears throat> naively we started to, to work away with um, with flint tools and we were able to successfully produce a series of um, bar points um, matching some of the styles and, and designs that we see at star car um, and we noted that in the process of doing so we didn't produce any of the little triangles or lozenges or fragments that, that were anticipated by previous authors. All we really produced was a considerable quantity of, of antler sawdust effectively, because so much of the way in which you can work antler with flint tools, which are incredibly sharp, but also really, really fragile, involves scraping and planing and not the kind of cutting and defining that you're able to work antler with, with metal tools. So, this was really interesting. It kind of it sort of perhaps moved us towards thinking about, yep, yeah, Starcar is the site where all of this stuff is going on, and it is the site where actually the entire process is playing out, and they're not taking this stuff necessarily off out into the landscape to finish off in other places. This is this is the site where barb points get made, um, and that was again it's a it's a product of um, working with Charles. It's a product of his generosity and. In donating um, the shed red deer antler that he had around, and it's a really, you know, it's a it's a really big deal. It was a it was a big finding for an undergraduate dissertation to make. Um, it was a it had important ramifications in terms of how we think about the broader artifact and material culture from the site, uh, because we were then sort of thinking and going back to some of the original materials that were collect were, were excavated from the site in the fifties, and going through and saying, actually, you know what some of these fragments of antler that have been previously categorized as 
or, or not categorized actually do look a lot like the removed splinters that um that you get from this process and actually there's now we've done the experiments we can see there's actually more evidence from the site of in situ production of bar points than we previously thought um and it helped build a, a kind of more robust and convincing argument um yeah and as i say that's all that's all down to to charles's uh, response to a, a plea to the bds for for materials and um, you know very grateful for that Moving forward then, um, experiments kind of really led by Amy Little um, at the Year Centre in York, uh, but also with the help of a, a, a chap from the Netherlands called David Comster. Um, one of the most iconic artefacts from Star Power are the red deer antler headdresses. Okay, so these are the top of a red deer skull um, with the antler still attached in, in most cases. And what's happened is the, the, the these are kind of a repeated pattern within the archaeology of Star Park. I think we now have 33 of them that have been excavated from the site to date. Really, really unusual. And they've sparked an awful lot of debate amongst archaeologists as to what these represent. So the original excavator of the site, Graham Clark, found um, 22, 23 of these objects um, and noted that they, they often have perforations. So they've got the kind of the nasal bones have been removed, the lower jaw has been removed, the lower parts of the brain case have been removed. He noted that the inside of the skull has often been smoothed away um, and perforations created, so little holes um, bored in the, in, the, in the skull itself. And then the antlers, are, when the antlers are present, they're often worked in interesting ways. So they're often um, using the same process, the groove and splinter process, as they do to make barbed points, but they're applying this to a really intensive extent and they're scooping out all the spongy core material from these um, from these antlers as well to really lighten them. The effect is that they're much lighter. Um, and in some instances, they retain the original form of the antlers, but they're much, much lighter. And, and, and Clark, the original excavator, um, interpreted this as modification for headgear. So he was thinking that this is this is what people are, you know, they're, they're, they're creating these objects. They're, they're basically headgear. They're being worn on the head of people at Star Car. Really, really fascinating. Sparked a whole load of debates um, about whether these are hunting disguises, so loads of ethnographic examples of groups of people from North America in particular, First, Na uh, First Nations and Native American people who um, wear deer disguises when they're hunting in order to stalk deer. So we'll, we'll modify deer skulls in a similar way um, and wear hides draped over themselves and use it to creep up and get really, really close to deer when they're hunting. Um, another school of thought looking at analogies with ethnographic groups in northern Siberia to say no this is this is a classic shamans shamans costume you know we've got examples of um event shamans who wear deer costumes in order to, to carry out kind of transformation rituals and to communicate with the spirits of, of, of deer and there's a really famous illustration um by a 17th century dutch explorer in, in Siberia uh, where he documented this um the, the, the one of these shamans wearing one of these headdresses with the antlers still attached and it, it does look very much reminiscent of what we see at star car so there's all this sort of debate raging about what they were used for what they're worn but um we noticed what amy noticed that actually there's been very little research carried out on how they've been made um so morris very very kindly sorted it out with um a stag's stag's head and a collection of roe deer skulls um and we kind of trialed a series of methods uh, trying to get to grips with exactly how these artifacts have been made and we were able to go back and check the the replicas the kind of attempted replicas that we were producing uh, against the archaeological material to see which of the replicas which method produced the kind of traces and the kind of um, working marks that we see on the archaeological examples and, and therefore build an argument for how we thought this was being done so um the process the kind of the, the process we, we tried a, a range of different ways and the process that we kind of settled on um, involved the use of clay uh, to help with the with the differential uh, retention of water when the when the when the head was heated. So what we got is the 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 the, the deer's head was was skinned in the first instance, and then the part portion of the skull that was intended for retention was covered with damp clay, and then this was placed at the ends of a fire for uh, several hours. What happens during that time is that the exposed areas of the skull are losing moisture, they're becoming more brittle, and the enclosed areas of the skull under the clay stay that's that little bit more moist, a little bit damper, a little bit cooler. What you could then do is take the skull out of, of the, the head out of the, the fire after several hours, and just using a simple hammer stone, so just, just a simple cobble, by 
tapping away around the edges of the, of the clade area, you can really quickly and easily remove the brittle areas of bone, leave the bits that you wanted, and what you get was this kind of really kind of neat, straight, flat, level edge, which is really characteristic of the finds we have from Starcar. But then you also get these kind of around the edges of that rim, you get these kind of disc shaped sort of um, negatives of removal, we call them. Um, so they're kind of like really kind of shallow little just little indentations around the edge, but whilst also producing a really kind of flat, flat line. Um, it's really distinctive in the Starcar front looks, and it's a, it's a process that we didn't really understand. Um, but through trial and error, we found that this method was was quite a good way of creating that effect. Um, then the perforations are really sort of quick and easy to create using a kind of pointed flint core tool, just pecking away um, to create those perforations. Uh, and the, probably the most time consuming aspect of, of creating one of these frontlets is actually the antler working. So the groove and splinter process we found to be incredibly laborious. It gets quicker the better you are at it and the more experienced you are, but actually the, the amount of labor involved in in removing that that much of the antler using this method is quite considerable and we, we were kind of taken by surprise by that so all of a sudden you know we have this understanding of you know the idea that these are kind of really sort of high status they're they're they're, they're, they're ritual artifacts they're very important or they're, they're incredibly important hunting tools very special objects um and then the realization that actually to make them you don't need a whole an awful lot of skill and they can be done and they don't take an awful lot of effort really other than the antlers it's the antlers that take take the effort um, so the whole load of, of, of really fascinating insights generated into this particular type of material culture. Now, the thing about the antler headdresses is that the red deer headdresses is that we find them at Starcar. We don't find them at any other site in Mesolithic Britain, certainly. And there's actually only a handful of sites from northern Germany. So the other side of Doggerland where we see anything similar. Um, one of these sites is a site called Bedburg's Conishoven, and you can see here the photos of, of some of the, the finds from Bedburg Conishoven. Very, very different. So you've got the antlers have been left retained, they're intact. You do have the reduction of the skull, but it's not carried out in this kind of really neat and tidy way that we see at Star Car. I don't know if you can see there, there are, there are some perforations which are made through the skull. But on the basis of our experiments, you know, we found that the really time consuming part is the antler work and that's not being carried out in, in northern Germany. So we've got objects which are reminiscent of what we find at Star Car. Certainly there seems to be a kind of a similar shared idea in terms of perhaps creating headgear or, or modifying the skulls of red deer in a particular way and creating these perforations. But they're not the same. It's not um, it's not like for like and it seems to be more of a of a shared idea as to what you could do with a red deer skull um, rather than the same people, you know, the same people making these objects at Starcar and in northern Germany. So we've got this kind of, you know, they're, they're a shared set of attitudes towards red deer perhaps, um, but it's not an identical technology that we're seeing um, uh, the other side of Doggerland. Of course, the frustrating thing for us as archaeologists is all the answers are probably going to be in Doggerland, which is now at the bottom of the North Sea. So whilst there's um, big research projects going on to, to map Doggerland and to work with the data generated by the oil companies to, to really get a high, a high resolution understanding of what this landscape looked like, um, what we really want to do as archaeologists is go and dig a hole there. And uh, that's just not possible because it's under lots and lots of water. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're kind of picking up the traces of these behavioural and cultural patterns around the edges of Doggerland. And we're sort of getting little glimpses as to what might be going on in this kind of in, in, in what is now a completely lost landscape. Another area in which the BDS has been contributing massively actually um, and it's kind of it kind of flies under the radar a little bit and it's something that, that, that is a, an emergent approach to uh, Mesolithic archaeology right across the continent uh, is and what, what, what we're kind of thinking of as an ethological approach to the study of the relationship between um, people and animals. So this is something that um, Dr. Nick Overton from Manchester, uh, Anja Munsrud from um, Oslo, sorry, Stavanger in Norway, um, Chantal Canella, who's my colleague here at, at Newcastle University and myself, have been working on um, for a number of years now. And a lot of these kind of thoughts and ideas stem from conversations with people who work with deer. So it's the conversations that I have with people at the AGM, um, several years ago now uh, in, in, in Newport, uh, but also uh, items we read in Deer Magazine, 
thinking about the kind of little the little anecdotes, the little observations, the little side comments that you get, the little little bits of noise that you pick up from talking to people who have extensive experience of working and living with deer that are really, really valuable in this context. So 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 basically this kind of ethological approach, thinking about humans and animals in the past, is is kind of based on the assumption that um People in the past thought about animals, probably thought about animals in a very, very different way to, to the way in which people do in the UK today. Um, animals take lots of different forms in terms of their role in cosmology and symbology and their, the relationship that people share with animals. And essentially, the reason people come to think about animals in different ways is because they encounter them in different ways. So, you know, the vast majority of people who encounter their chicken um, shrink wrapped in the supermarket and you know encounter their animals in very kind of specific cultural contexts it's the it's the nature of those encounters that that shape their attitude towards towards those animals um, and in the deep past people encounter animals in very different ways um, and actually most archaeologists don't have that expert level of knowledge that 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 kind of intimate understanding of what it's like to encounter deer um, at different times of day in different environments what the, the kind of the nuance and the detail of deer behavior um, but actually that's something that people in the past would have been really, really fine-tuned and, and attuned to. So there's a whole load of um, inspiration, I think, that um, myself, Nir Kanya and, and Chantel have drawn from um, conversations with uh, people in the British Deer Society and other kind of ethological organisations who have experience of working with wildlife um, outdoors that have been really influential in, in the development of that particular line of thought. And it's something that's that's kind of, growing at the european scale and how and how people are over europe think about um animals in the mesolithic next question next kind of um set of experiments that i wanted to talk about uh relate to some material that was very kindly donated to me when i was at ucd by john hetherington um and basically this was investigating a question that i was i had an interest in that stemmed back to my phd so when i was when i was doing my phd i was looking at um red deer antler in the mesolithic well, well antler of, of all species of deer in the mesolithic from right across britain and um i was using a, te a technique of analysis that's developed in france um, called traceology which involves looking at, at working marks and matching them to experimentally generated material and one of the one of the interesting things is having been trained in in france is that you learn a different set of typology and a different set of terms for artifacts. And one of the things that that brought to light was the fact that we have um, what are known as T-axes. So they're, they're portions of red deer, um, we've got a medial portion of the red deer beam, a tread time that's been taken away, and there are the kind of these axe shapes created and the perforation is, is put through the stump of the tine um, to allow it to be hafted. Um, these are really, really classically associated with the Ertebola period of um, southern Scandinavia. So this is late Mesolithic, hunter-gatherers living in southern Scandinavia, often assumed to be living this really affluent lifestyle. You know, they're kind of really sedentary, they're really settled in southern Scandinavia. The environment is really, really rich. Um, the material culture is incredibly elaborate at this time. Um, the analogy is often drawn between uh, northwest Pacific coast uh, hunter-gatherers in the sort of like 18th and 19th century, you know, these, these people who had who are living really well and building really kind of impressive and, and substantial structures and lifeways um, in landscapes that they know incredibly well. Um, at that point of time in, in the late Mesolithic of, of, of southern Scandinavia, um, they're producing tea axes. And from my work, we've discovered that there are actually tea axes turning up on sites in Scotland. So um, in the Inner Hebrides, a little island called Oronsay, um, in Risca, the Isle of Merkin Peninsula, um, and most recently, um, finds have been coming to light. Oh yeah, a place called Meeklewood on the on the east coast of of, of Scotland. Um, and most recently, uh, a site called Taradale, which is um, the, up, up near Inverness. It's a coastal site up near in, Inverness. Um, that's really interesting. And I was lucky enough when I was working at UCD to be able to go and study some of the material from northern Germany. A site called Nastet. So it's a site in on just. It's a submerged site just off the Baltic coast, um, but it's in northern Germany and it forms part of this kind of Ertebola culture that we see in the late Mesolithic. So I was able to go and do some comparative technological analysis. So I'd looked at the material from Scotland. I had an idea as to how I thought, not only identifying the fact that there are T-axes there, but how those T-axes are being made, the techniques that are being used to produce those T-axes. And I was able to go to Germany 
and look at um, a similar t-axis assemblage and look at the material the materials associated with that and i was really kind of quite adamant that they're being produced in exactly the same way so the the methods that's used to make the t-axis in in the sites in germany is almost exactly the same as the methods used to to make the t-axis in scotland so this is this is a kind of a, a, a contrasting situation to what we what i was talking about before in terms of star car and the, the red deer headdresses in terms of the relationship between Germany. Um, in the later Mesolithic, we seem to have this kind of almost identical replication of the, of the techniques used. But of course, it wasn't just enough for me kind of to, to put together that idea and speculate about it. I wanted to test it. Um, I wanted to see if using the method that I thought was being used, whether we produce um, similar artifacts and also similar production wastes. So uh, uh, John, very, very kindly, again, the call went out through Morris um, for some shared red deer antler and he supplied me um over in ucd with a with a literally a bootload of, of material which just gave us all sorts of opportunities to try out different things um, and i worked with a group of master students at the center um for experimental archaeology and material culture at ucd um so they run a, they run a master's course there and we had a really you know over the course of a couple of days um we were able to get the students to start producing t-axes and just as we thought, um, the, the, the traces and the artifacts were, were identical to what we see in the archaeological record. Um, it was an interesting process though, and it threw up a few surprises. Uh, one of the things about working with experimental archaeologists, and especially ex experimental archaeology students, it's the same situation in, in York, um, is that they've had a chance to work with lots of different types of technology. And they quickly become quite sort of attuned to, uh, to making kind of snap comparisons. And it was really notable that the group of students we were working with had been doing some flint napping previously. And flint napping is quite a tricky thing to do. It's uh, not everyone gets it, but it's quite hard. And it's kind of a percussive <laughs> striking nodes of uh, lumps of flint in a very particular way to create tools in the shape that you want. Um, but they, all, they, they just didn't have the patience for the antler work because the, although the flint work is, is technically harder, you do it and it's done. You know, if you get it right, you get it right. You get it wrong, you messed it up. But it was the kind of the, the patience required and the time that was needed to invest into working the antler that lots of people commented on. And the people who were really, really good flint nappers uh, often didn't have the patience. They, you know, they were there kind of into that instant gratification of good flint napping. They didn't have the, 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 the patience to see some of the antler working projects um, through with the time that they needed. Um, so yeah, so we're finding some, making some really interesting findings in terms of T-axes. So as I said before, uh, we've got the same artifacts. Uh, they're, they're, they're identical. You could take one from a site in Scotland oh, and right. it into one of these German sites sure. and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. <laughs> you do that. We've yeah. got the same methods of production. Um, and we also, I'll just go back a slide, have really, really uh, similar patterns of breakage. So uh, I don't know if you can see there that both these T-axes have got kind of breakage, breakage at, the, at the back end of the axe. This is the kind of, this is the sort of axe blade. And then this area here is the, is, is the end. Um, and there's a really interesting theory emerging from um, a series of archaeologists working in Germany uh, that they think what these axes are actually used for is wedges for splitting um, big trees and creating log boats. So basically what you've got there is that kind of that axe blade is acts as a wedge. And you'd have a long, thin handle attached through the perforation and you line it up on the where you want to split the log. And then you bang on top with a hammer and insert your wedge to help start splitting the log. And by having this kind of handle attached, it means that you can work as a single person. One person can can split a very large piece of wood and kind of line it up from from the back end. So there's been some experiments done with that, um, and it's also a period of time where we know they're producing log boat canoes in the Ottobola period. We we don't have any evidence of that from Scotland, but we certainly do from southern Scandinavia. We've got burials in canoes and. We know that they're, they're, they're splitting timber in, in these particular ways. So there may be a link there between um, not only these artifacts, but also their breakage patterns in the production of canoes. So yeah, so same artifacts, same production sequence, same breakage patterns. But then there are also some really interesting differences in terms of what happens to these artifacts after they've been broken. So one of the things I noticed um, with the material from northern Germany is that a lot of these artifacts have quite extensive dog gnawing marks on. So they've got impressions from dog teeth um, and these often overlay the breakage the areas of breakage within within, within the artifact so there's a there's an indication there that once these objects have been broken they're thrown to the dogs as chew toys 
Now, none of that evidence comes from Scotland. In Scotland, we do seem to have something very, very different going on, which is when these objects have broken in Scotland, what often happens is that they're smashed up into very, very small pieces, like deliberately smashed. Um, and then those small pieces are used as what's called bevel-ended tools. So these are these kind of like sort of little fragments of, of bone or antler, maybe the size of your thumb. Um, and we think they're being hafted and used as hide scraping tools. Um, there's kind of some debate as to exactly what they're for, but it's really obvious when you start to look at it that some of these uh, bevel-ended tools have little kind of fragments of perforations or, or parts of the working edge that we could see on the T-axis, which indicate that they were in a previous slide part of a T-ax. So there's obviously some element of recycling going on. And that, that kind of makes sense in places like Orense, you know, sort of small Hebridean islands that don't have a native deer population on them and where you might want to manage a material like antler that isn't so easy to get hold of. Um, but other context doesn't work so well. You know, Risca, the Isle of Merkin Peninsula, there's plenty of, there's, we expect there'd be plenty of red deer around there um, and also at Taradale as well. So there's, there's something interesting there in terms of attitudes towards material and recycling and material management. That's very, very different. So again, we have this, this, this shared across the North Sea, we have this shared concept of what, a, what a, an amp of T-ax is and how you should make them um, and what you should use them for, but really different attitudes to what you do with those artifacts once they've broken um, and how, or how you dispose of those artifacts. Now, at this point, I want to introduce uh, the work of Andy Langley, um, who's a PhD student at the University of York working with Andy at the Year Centre. Um, and he's conducting a really, really interesting project looking at container technologies. So one of the things that kind of characterises the Mesolithic um, in Britain and Ireland, certainly, is that you've got groups of hunter-gatherers and they don't have ceramic technologies. So this is before the arrival of pottery in Ireland and Britain. Um, and so people are surviving, they're, they're, they're not surviving, they're thriving, and they've got a life way that doesn't involve the use of ceramic technologies. And that's just something that's been taken for granted for, by archaeologists for a long time now. Um, people see, uh, you know, that's just what the archaeological record is for this period. You don't get pottery. If you get pottery, it's from a later period. Um, but Andy's work is really, really interesting because he's looking at what the implications for um, not having pottery are for container technologies. And what is it that soft containers as, as we think of them, um, containers made from organic materials, what is it that they can technologically do and what can't they do and what are the implications for life ways of people. So you know there's classic some of the some of the kind of um classic lazy assumptions about this kind of thing is that oh if you've not got um ceramic technology you couldn't possibly boil water you know because it's ceramics that allow you to heat up water um in a fire to to, to get it to boiling point. Um, and the experiments that Danny's been running um, using deer hides um, have demonstrated that that's just not the case. You know, that, that actually you can boil water in all sorts of different contexts um, and that's not a limit. Um, you know, and if you think of the importance of boiling water for how your food preparation works, cuisine, keeping things clean, keeping things sterile, it's a really important technological um, step to have. Also, Andy's been working on uh, food preparation. Um, and the production of tars and resins. And he's demonstrating through his experimental work that um, actually what's going on in the Mesolithic in terms of container technologies, although we don't have any kind of clear evidence for it, there's potential that people are living really kind of, that, that, these, that these technologies are, are, are incredibly complex um, and they allow, to do, allow people to do all of the things, almost all of the things that, that pottery allows them to do. Which kind of brings us to this question of um, why do people adopt pottery at the end of the Mesolithic with the start of farming. You know, there seems to, there's, a, there's this really interesting period of time from around 4,500 Cal BC uh, for about sort of 500 years where all of the groups around the North Sea Basin, um, other than Britain and Ireland, whether they're agricultural groups, whether they're farming groups, Neolithic groups, or whether they're hunter-gatherer groups, Mesolithic groups, they're all using and producing pottery in some form. But for a period of several hundred years, um, hunter-gatherer groups in Britain resist that and they don't do that and it's Andy's, Andy's research is really interesting because it's kind of giving us a new insight as to why that is you know actually if you don't have you, you don't need pottery in order to do many of the things that people traditionally associate pottery with um, and actually if you've got a pre-existing technology which works perfectly well you know what where's the incentive what do you what do you why do you need to adopt pottery 
Um, and, and Andy's work is really kind of hammering that home. More broadly, though, both the combination of Andy's work with deer hides and, and cooking methods and soft container technologies and the stuff that I've been doing with T-axes um, is giving us this really a series of really interesting insights into what's going on in Britain at the end of the Mesolithic and what we call the fifth millennium Cal BC. So the final thousand years of the Mesolithic in, in Britain and Ireland is this period of time, like I said before, where um, agriculture is spreading right across Europe. It's, it's making its way. Um, onto the kind of the, the coast of northern France and Iberia. Hunter-gatherer groups in, in Scandinavia and the Low Countries are doing really well, really kind of affluent, adopting pottery, sharing pottery technologies, engaging and, 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 and exchanging uh, material cultures and ideas with, with farming groups. And the traditional understanding of Britain and Ireland at this time is that they're cut off, that they're isolated that they don't adopt farming when farming gets to the northwest coast of France and, and Iberia um, because they're not talking to people in France and Iberia. They're, they're isolated by the North Sea. They're not crossing the North Sea and having these conversations. Um, they don't start doing the things that we see in the Ertebola period in southern Scandinavia because they're not in touch with people in southern Scandinavia either. Um, and actually, the, the material that the British Deer Society has been donating to us has demonstrated that that's, that's just not the case. And actually... We've got evidence in, in Scotland, certainly, of, of, of ideas traveling across the North Sea. People are clearly making that voyage. Those ideas don't just jump. Um, the, that's hunter-gatherer groups in maritime, engaging in maritime networks and crossing the North Sea and making it to both the East Coast and the West Coast of Scotland in order to share those ideas and to, to show people how you make a TX in the style that we see in Southern Scandinavia. Um, but then we also don't see ceramics doing that. So what, what's going on there? What is, what is the North Sea actually doing at the very end of the Mesolithic? Why is it that some ideas are able to cross this body of water and others aren't? Um, and so to think about that in a bit more detail, uh, we've, myself and Amy have been looking at um, analogies. So other parts of the world <clears throat> where we see uh, hunter-gatherer groups adopting pottery or not adopting pottery um, and resistance to pottery. And there's some really interesting lessons to be learned um, from Japan and also nor northern Scandinavia uh, in this regard. So what we see in Japan is um, hunter-gatherers start to make pottery really, really early on in the sequence. It's one of the kind of earliest earliest places in the world that we see pottery being produced by hunter-gatherers is in Japan in the kind of the final, the late stage of the Pleistocene and into the early Holocene. But what happens is um, they're kind of, they're experimenting with this technology, the idea of firing clay, and they're doing little bits and pieces, like little bits of experiments, maybe kind of like ad hoc, um, creating fired clay and little bits of pottery on a kind of ad hoc basis to kind of solve particular problems in a particular moment, but it never really gets going into a tradition. Um, and at this time, you've got groups of hunter-gatherers living right across Japan in quite isolated um, kind of small groups. And then as the climate ameliorates in the Holocene, um, these groups start to grow and they start to become more interconnected. And you can see with the archaeological record that they start exchanging ideas and, and, and talking to each other more and more. Um, and at that point, this tradition of pottery and ceramic production really kind of takes off. So it's associated with um, perhaps a rise in population, perhaps an increase in population, but it's also associated with a change in communication and different groups of people starting to talk to each other in different ways. And that in Japan is what leads to um, hunter-gatherers really taking off with ceramics. Um, and the argument there is that uh, if you're only seeing people very occasionally, it's quite difficult to convince them to invest in something like the production of pottery which involves quite a delayed um return you know you have to you have to work quite hard in terms of gathering firewood in terms of and you have to have kind of faith that this process is going to work you know that having done all this work you're going to get a pot that is usable out the other side of it um, so there's this idea that if you're only seeing people briefly it's quite difficult to make the case that that's what you need to do and actually what you need is more sustained contact and sustained conversations and again we see a similar thing in northern scandinavia the adoption of ceramics only comes in where we see both an increase in population density and changes in communication networks. So people talking to new groups of people and having, you know, forming new relationships with different between communities. Um, that's when we see the, the, the advent of ceramics in, in northern Scandinavia. And that does seem to fit with what we've got going on in Britain and Ireland at this time. So um, whilst we have some ideas which make it across the North Sea, you know, ideas like T axes. Um, which you know seem to be quite a sort of pick up and drop. You've got people working out there already in in Scotland, certainly, 
um, before the arrival of TXs. So it's a material they're familiar with. Um, it's kind of an easy sell for people who might not be spending too much time or quite sort of brief or sporadic conversations between um, groups of people um, connected through these maritime networks. Um, whereas pottery is a little bit different in terms of it needs that kind of, it needs more trust, it needs more longer engagement, and it needs a kind of shared understanding of how materials work, you know, that you will get a fired pot if you if you treat it in this particular way. And also it needs the, the kind of the, the push that it's advantageous, that it's better than what you're doing at the moment. And again, perhaps that is um, something that's difficult to do if you're only making occasional trips, um, not very often trips across the North Sea at certain times. But one of the most interesting aspects of this debate is that um, the genetic evidence which is starting to emerge as we've got new techniques developing um, is, is one of the things it's suggesting is that in the Mesolithic, in the late Mesolithic in Britain and Ireland, um, that we might have low population densities. And so in the context of that, you know, that, that, that although they're very ecologically productive and they're great places to live, there might not actually be that many people living in Britain and Ireland during the late Mesolithic. Um, so then now we've got the kind of the, the picture that we see elsewhere with low population densities. And then at the start of the Neolithic, as new people start coming into the UK, and um, Ireland, and as, as things start to change in terms of the attitudes towards material culture with, with new people coming in, uh, that's when we see the big advent of, of ceramics taking off and pottery becoming really widespread across um, Ireland and Britain. So in conclusion then, I said this would be a bit of a loving, and I hope I've really stressed to you the, the tangible contribution that the BDS has been making um, to to Mesolithic research, um, the research that myself and Amy have been carrying out. Um, I'll just to turn a light on because it's got very dark all of a sudden. So yeah, so it's it, it, a lot of this work and a lot of these new ideas and new thinking about the Mesolithic is a direct product of the relationship that myself and Amy have built up with you, with the BDS over, as I say, the last decade. Um, and that it's really, it's really making a significant contribution. You know, this is not just, this goes way beyond Star Power in terms of the experiments that we've been carrying out. This is transforming um, our understanding of the intercommunity relations um, all around the North Sea and Doggerland throughout the Mesolithic period. Um, and it's really, uh, we're really grateful. I hope I've demonstrated that we're really grateful for the generosity of uh, BDS and its members in supporting that research. Um, and we're really hopeful that, that can continue. So I know, We've got more experiments lined up um, and there's more things that we'd like to do, things that we'd like to do in the future, um, but we, which will we will be coming to you cap in hand again to ask you for your unwanted bits of deer that might be lying around. Um, but I, I hope I've demonstrated to you that when you get that kind of request to, to send something in, be it a stag head or a bit of antler or a, or a deer foot, that um, this is what happens to it. It's going, it's contributing towards a really uh, radical reappraisal of this particular period of prehistory and were we to take the bds out of our research for the last 10 years a lot of what i've told you today the things that we've been discovering and the ideas that we've been developing wouldn't be wouldn't be as they are it'd be very different so um i'm going to conclude there morris i've no idea what the time is i've kind of blacked out a little bit because i'm not having a dinner but i hope we're doing all right you're doing absolutely splendidly thank you ben and um, I, th I think uh, we might make a move to ensure that the uh, watching of the, um, the stream is compulsory for BDS members. Um, comes as part of their membership card, I think, because that way they would be able to understand why they can make a contribution that is really um, helping some most amazing research. And I'm singularly impressed, um, having maintained the contact with you for some time, with the quality and the originality and innovatory approaches that you're employing uh, with Amy and the other research students is absolutely outstanding. And I think tonight we've been able to see how that research is impacted upon and developed the knowledge um, that we have of the Mesolithic. Um, but nobody wants to hear me, but, but thank you so very much for that um, very eloquent um, presentation. I wonder if, um, we can um, close down the uh, PowerPoint and allow ourselves to um, see um, uh, faces here. And um, we are a very select group tonight. And if you want to um, 
put your videos uh, on and your cameras on, um, it may be opportune for you to ask a question. If you want to wave your hand or put up your um, uh, little electronic hand, we should have um, time for perhaps 10 or 15 minutes um, of questions if anyone's got any questions. Any questions? David, start with David, you top of my screen. Yeah, I remember to turn my microphone on this time. Um, the headdresses that appear to be made, I just thought there might be another reason why they've been made, is, is a sort of a trophy to signify you've had a successful hunt. Coming back, um, having been off hunting, you come back with wearing one of those in the same way that the uh, modern German hunters stick a, a, a fur shriek in their cap. Um, have you got any ideas about that? Yeah, it's an interesting idea, and we did look at um, display trophies. You know, like obviously, the, there's there's a clear resonance there with the way in which we display trophy racks today. You know, it's that, that, that kind of attention to the antlers. Um, and we did a few bits and pieces where we were suspending um, deer skulls on sticks and on stakes and in trees to kind of like simulate that sort of presentation angle. But it didn't really, it didn't really explain the the um, why the perforations were being made because it's perfectly possible to do that with a deer skull once it had been cleaned or, or even uncleaned um, without without creating those perforations and working it in a way that had been worked. But I do think the idea of um, displaying kind of trophies as part of, as headgear is worth some consideration and thinking about a bit more because you know it's a really um it's kind of it's almost obvious screamingly obvious to say but to to to, to wear one of these objects the first thing that you're saying is that we've hunted and killed this animal um that's, that's, a, that's a really kind of clear statement um and it's interesting that they do in some instances retain the size and the shape of the antlers um you know to kind of maybe show off some of the prestige of the animal that's been that's been hunted but i, I think my, my colleague um up here in newcastle chantelle canelo she's been really she she's worked for a long time uh, on the interpretation of these objects and one of the things she's always really keen to stress is that it doesn't have to be an either or interpretation of these, of these artifacts that it's perfectly possible to be showing off about what you've hunted and also be a really important piece of ritual um costume or showing off about what you've hunted and also a really important hunting tool for for, for the next hunt so um yeah i mean that's that's a that's a that's a great suggestion and it's um yeah it's something that we should be mindful of um uh, yeah thanks very much great um susan hi this evening i just wanted to ask about the containers um with the soft con is there any is there any evidence that those that had soft containers longer were moving more or further distances or moving in different patterns to the people that had surrounded? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Thanks, Susan. Um, and there's actually been the 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 established anthropological literature on this, um, kind of a chap called Arnold, you know, big kind of survey of of, of hunter gatherer and agricultural groups in in across the Americas in the 1980s, established that. He, the original hypothesis was that um, ceramics are all, all about sedentism um, and that you don't make ceramics if you're highly mobile because they break, they're big, they're bulky, they're not particularly, they're not particularly practical if you're kind of spending a lot of time on the move. Um, and so that, that was kind of the, the, dominant, the dominant theory for a while is that when you see uh, ceramic using hunter-gatherers, that means that they're more sedentary and they're more settled. Uh, but more recently, when that kind of survey has been extended globally, it's been found that actually, you know, in, in large portions of Eurasia, so in Siberia, um, and also kind of more northern latitudes, you do get ceramic using hunter-gatherers who are incredibly mobile. What you tend to find is that the ceramics are smaller um, and they're often fired in different ways to, to kind of, to counter that sort of, that innate, um, unpractical nature of, of, of shifting big, big ceramic containers around long distances. But either um, they're being cached, so either either hunter gatherers leave them in certain spots in the landscape and return to them if they're not too mobile, or they're producing uh, fabrics that are, that are that are capable of being of being carried longer distances. So, um, in answer to your question, it's really hard to get a sense of quite how mobile 
um, hunter gatherers were in Britain at this time. We have a few little insights from the Inner Hebrides that people are certainly mobile around island systems. You know that they're that they're um, when when they are living in coastal locations that they're they're jumping they're, they're island hopping and that through the course of their lives they're they're spending some time on the mainland, sometimes on islands. Um, but actually pinning down exactly how far a person's travelled in their lifetime um, is a really it's a really difficult thing to do because I think of myself as being fairly sedentary, but for a while I was commuting from London to Dublin. <laughs> For work and you know you, you get in the car and drive for 40 minutes to work every day um you know you, that, 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 it, it can be really hard to pin down exactly what we mean by by how mobile and sedentary are uh, in the present let alone in the, in the deep past but it's a good question and um and yeah it's something that anthropologists certainly considered um in, in the late late 20th century okay brilliant any any other questions any other thoughts Morris, there's a question in the in the live chat from a Richard Kerr, I think. Um, did uh, was there Lyme disease in the population due to contact with animals? Lyme disease in the population. That's a very good question. It's uh, it's not something I know about actually. Um, I think we. We struggle with well, there's a number of reasons that we um, that we struggle to identify disease in the Mesolithic generally. Um, one of them is that basically for this kind of period of time, unless something has a has a genetic signature, or it leaves a trace on the on the osseous skeleton of the person that's been affected, it's very very difficult to identify particular causes of illness. You know, so m mechanical stuff, trauma, um, tends to be better represented or better understood because you get remodeling a bone or you get kind of responses in muscle attachments which, which give us hints from the skeleton of the deceased that, that that's what happened but specific diseases that don't leave those kinds of traces can be can be really tricky to pin down the other problem that we face in particular in relation to the british mesolithic is that our record for human remains is really really poor um we basically we don't have any well we have very very few um certainly intact skeletons the vast majority of the human remains that we have for the Mesolithic in Britain are fragments of human bone which have turned up in caves and have been dated for the Mesolithic. Um, so they're a great source of, of, of ADNA. We can extract DNA from them. We can learn about their, the genome of those people. But um, it's just not a, it's not a good enough record to, to start to pin those, down those diseases. So, um, yeah, I'm afraid we don't know. It's a really good question. And um, I think that kind of commensal relationship between species and the isn't isn't well thought enough through but that's exactly the ethological um approach that that, arche that a lot of archaeologists are moving towards now and i think that's um those are the kinds of questions that talking to people who have experience working with deer um put at closer quarters would would, would really benefit and, and would help frame some new questions so thank you it, it's certainly something we'll flag up for some of our researchers as to when lung disease suddenly popped up because it, it's most of us it's quite a modern disease but of course we don't know when it wasn't identified or when people didn't know what it was um, so that's something that we could um, uh, flag up for some of the researchers because we do sponsor quite a bit of research nationally on Lyme disease any other questions mm. although there's been a question but it might be more an observation um, a number of years ago a friend of mine made a whole headdress similar to what you're talking about and I think he used a, a red uh, for the headdress, and he used a whole skull. And I remember trying it on, and it weighed an absolute ton. So I can see why they would go for something like a robe and make it an awful lot smaller. And by just <laughs> by taking the top of the head off, um, that makes an awful lot less weight to put on top of your uh, 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 in your head. Yeah. Um, thanks. I, I, I should stress, I didn't mention the presentation either, but in the early Holocene, these are really big, these are really big animals, big red deer. So, you know, estimates based on the, on the former remains and the size of the bones is they're kind of 30% larger than your, than your big red deer that you might find in the Highlands of Scotland, you know, because they're, they're living in forested environments. Um, they're not kind of exposed, they're not at high altitudes and they've, they've got really kind of optimum conditions and they, and they get really big. So that whole process of thinning the antlers is a is a really kind of I think a strong a strong argument for them being worn as headgear because you know it's if they are going to be worn as headgear that's what you have to do and it's 
it's interesting that those examples I showed from northern Germany um, aren't thinned, aren't lightened in the same way. And I struggle sometimes to see how they could function as headgear practically because they'd be so imbalanced. I, I was, I was keeping meaning to try to set up a little project working with um, costume designers because I end up talking about this stuff and as an archaeologist, I've got no idea um, you know, the, the, the mechanics and the logistics of creating headgear and actually what you need to do in terms of balance. And I think uh, yeah, costume designers, people who work in theatre who put together elaborate costumes might be a really good source of, uh, source of insight, but not quite got around to that one yet. It's, it's so rewarding to hear that there are so many avenues of uh, opening up for further research, and it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I, I do have to say that I, I remember um, uh, Rufus King Edward um, coming to the Buckles when you were talking there, um, uh, Amy and Ben, and uh, I, I do have to commend Rupert tonight because he's dialing in from Somalia, where he's currently deployed, which um, is... Uh, Absolutely fantastic. We've, we've gone truly international tonight. And in, in many, many ways, in many of the hills up there, we've got people who are um, trotting around there who are still genuine hunter-gatherers and survive uh, on a knife edge. Mm. Um, so I think if we've got no more questions um, for this evening, we'll close there. And um, I think what we can say, Ben, is we certainly will guarantee we will ensure that um, the pots of red deer that are required will be winging their way quite often slowly um, and it's been quite difficult with the pandemic but uh, we will ensure that um, uh, heads uh, are delivered for you um, but perhaps if necessary um, hides as well because um, they, they obviously now have a youth and are active in the research mm -hmm. so it's absolutely fascinating to pick up with you again a really big thank you um, from everyone um, if you look on the reactions bar, you might want to wave a hand or you might just want to wave goodbye. Uh, but thank you very uh, much, everyone. Um, if you have any really burning questions and it's keeping you up at night, send me an email and I'll get an answer for you. So thank you very much. Keep safe and uh, look forward to meeting you again at some point in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Cheers, Morris.